All right, we are beginning a new series this morning titled Worthy as the Lamb. Uh, it's a five-part series that will include our Good Friday service. And our goal throughout our Easter series is to show the worthiness of the Lamb that was slain. And my desire after our series we just came out of uh, was to stay in the book of Revelation because I think the more we can stay in there, uh, the better off we are and the, and the more blessed we are in doing that. So we'll, we will do that by focusing on pictures of the Lamb. We'll be looking at Revelation 19 today and, and next Sunday, uh, 2021, and then we'll finish up in chapter 5, which is the great throne room of God and the unveiling of the Lamb who was worthy. Today we'll begin looking uh, in our series at the marriage banquet of the Lamb, probably uh, one of the most overlooked events when you hear about people talking about eschatology, uh, at least I know from what I've heard. And so I hope it's, a, it's going to be a great eye-opener for us as we look at this next great event that we'll be looking forward to. We'll see Jesus as the bridegroom who finally gets to celebrate with his bride. Next Sunday, we'll look at the coming of the Lamb, where we'll deal with Jesus as a warrior that comes to establish his kingdom. Then we'll move into the provision of the Lamb, where we'll look at Jesus fulfilling his promises. And we'll look at the, the new heaven and new earth, where we'll spend eternity. On Good Friday, we'll look at the judgment of the Lamb. We'll be talking about the great white throne judgment there. Then on Easter Sunday, we'll be looking at the Lamb who is worthy, again, who is unfolded in Revelation 5 for us. So today, we're going to begin our series looking at an event that Jesus has been waiting for for many, many years, and hopefully it won't be long, and that is the marriage supper of the Lamb. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Revelation chapter 19, and we'll be diving into verses 6 through 10. Now, throughout the Old Testament and even and in the New Testament, we've always had this picture painted of Jesus as the bridegroom and the church as the bride of Christ. You don't see that really any more prolific than in Ephesians 5, where Paul talks about uh, marriage. He talks about husbands and wives, and now husbands are the treat their wives. And he references at the very end of that, that the mystery he's explaining really is about Christ and his church. And so there's this unbelievably great event that we're looking forward to, church, that will actually be next. Now, I thought you probably are thinking to yourself, well, I thought the rapture was going to be next. So we're going to put that in its context. But I want us to point to and think about this great wedding banquet that's coming. Now, to do that, I want us to understand the path to the banquet. So for us to really understand the concept of not just a wedding banquet, but the timing of events that have happened in our lives spiritually and prophetically, we need to really understand the culture of the ancient Jewish wedding. There are actually six major steps. Some people have five, some people have seven, but really six major steps or parts of the ancient Jewish wedding that I think is very applicable to our spiritual lives. So I'm going to run through that first so we can understand kind of the path to get to this banquet, and then we'll dive into the preparation of the bride and then the purpose of the banquet as well. So let's talk about this ancient Jewish wedding process. Basically, the first thing that would happen in an ancient Jewish wedding is there would be a selection of the bride. Now, the father would select the bride for the son. And so once the father had selected the bride for the son, that was going to be the bride that the son would spend all of eternity with or the rest of their lives with as far as the wedding was concerned. We know that the father has chosen us. He's allowed us to be a part of the bride of Christ. Now, I believe, and again, don't get hung up on that. I just believe that God has chosen us. If, if he hadn't chosen us, then we wouldn't have the opportunity to be, have this unveiling of the Holy Spirit in our lives for us to even understand the gospel. We cannot understand the gospel on our own. And so we understand that Christ has, that the father has allowed us to see that through Jesus. The second thing that would happen is there would be a price that was paid for the bride. There was a price paid to the father of the bride. This price was paid to show how much the bridegroom loved and valued the bride. Now, Jesus paid the ultimate price for his bride. He told the, Paul told the Corinthian church that we've been bought with a price. So what does it mean that we've been bought with a price? That's, that's bridal language. That means that the groom has paid for the bride. He has purchased, he's, he's paid that price to the father of the bridegroom. And so we were paid for. Jesus Christ paid for us by his blood. That price has been paid. Then the third thing was what was called a betrothal period. Now, the wedding ceremony consisted of two major parts. The first part ended with the betrothal period, and we'll get into the second part in just a second. This first part is called the betrothal period or the engagement. Now, the engagement is kind of where we saw Mary and Joseph uh, when she was found pregnant. If you remember when she was found pregnant, the Bible says that Joseph was considering to divorce her. 
So how could he divorce her in the context of an engagement? Well, in Jewish culture, a betrothal ceremony was actually binded by a covenant and an arrangement that was made, and it was bound by a contract. At the betrothal ceremony, a marriage contract called the ketubah would be presented to the father. And so the contract would include all the bridegroom's promises to the bride. Now, once the ketubah was established, it would be sealed but with a cup of wine. Once that was done, the bridegroom would give the bride a gift to remember him by while he he was gone. And so the groom would give the bride a gift. Now, today we see this as a practice of giving an engagement ring. It's a symbol of love and commitment. We've been given the Holy Spirit as our sign of commitment from our bridegroom. So think about that. Our bridegroom gave his bride a gift. And the gift that he gave us was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sealed us for the day of redemption. What's the day of redemption? The day of redemption is what we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes. And so we've been given our engagement ring, if you want to look at it that way. The Holy Spirit is our sealing of our salvation. It is the commitment that we have from our bridegroom. So church, understand this. We are currently in the betrothal period. Now when we come to Christ in salvation, we enter into a covenant agreement with the Father And here's what's amazing. Our contract spelling out all the promises that the bridegroom is going to do for the bride is, guess where? Is the word of God. This is our contract. This is what the groom promises the bride. And so we have this in front of us. So church, we are in right now the betrothal period. We've been betrothed to the Father through the Son, through our groom. We've been given the Holy Spirit that seals us for the day of redemption And we're just waiting for the second part of the marriage ceremony to begin. Now, once the marriage covenant was sealed, then the bridegroom would go back to the father's house. This is the departure of the groom. So there was always a departure of the groom. And what's interesting is that the the groom would depart and he would go back to his father's house and he would prepare a wedding chamber and a place where they were going to spend the rest of their lives. Now, the bridegroom could be gone for many months, and the father would oversee the building of this wedding chamber or this house. And a lot of times in the Old Testament, it was just basically expanding the tent. Now, here's what's amazing. When the father felt like the bridal chamber was finished, he would tell his son to go get his bride. So the father would be the one to tell the son to go get the bride. What did Jesus say when he was on earth? No man knows when the Son of Man is coming back. No one knows but the Father. Why is that? Because the Father would be the one that would tell the Son to go get his bride. So church, we are in this period right now where we're waiting for the Father to tell the Son to go get the bride. We're in this betrothal period. Then there would be a return of the bridegroom. This is actually The return would actually begin the second part of the wedding ceremony. This would begin what what is called the home taking. Now, the father would send his son to get his bride. It would usually happen in the middle of the night, and the shofar would be blown, and there would be an announcement in the streets that the bridegroom has come for his bride. Now, if any of you all were ever in Carl Carl Jones' Sunday school class, Carl would come here periodically with a shofar, and he would blow it, a big horn, and it would go, or something like that. So you can imagine... You can imagine being in your village, you're a bride that has been betrothed to a groom. Your groom has left and you don't know when he's coming back. You have no idea when he's coming back. But here's what the bride was told. The bride was told, you just need to be ready when your groom comes. And so every day the bride would wake up and she would say, I wonder if it's going to be today. And then it would happen. And the next day she would say, I wonder if it's going to be today. So she would wait every day. And then there would be a time where normally at midnight, they said, culturally, when I read this, normally what would happen at midnight, you would hear this shofar and you would hear the horn blow in this small village. Well, more than likely, I don't know if there were multiple brides waiting for their grooms to come back, but you probably knew that was for you. And the horn would blow, an announcement would be made, and the groom would come for his bride. Once then, the last thing that would happen would be the wedding banquet. Once the bridegroom had returned with his bride, there would be seven days of presentation. This would be a time of festivity and celebration as the bride was presented to the bridegroom. The time of celebration would end with the wedding banquet. That's what we're going to talk about today. 
Now, this is when the bridegroom and the bride would enter into their final union and be celebrated with a great banquet. Now, I want you to think about those six steps. I want you to think about your salvation. I want you to think about our Christian life. Isn't it amazing to know that we're actually in this betrothal period right now where we are the bride and we're waiting for our groom to come back and get us. And so we're sitting here and we're waiting and that horn could be blown any day. What does Paul teach us? Paul said that there's going to be a trumpet blast and an announcement from the archangel that the groom has come for his bride. And that's going to be us. Now I want you to listen to these familiar verses And I want you to listen to them through the context of understanding the process of a Jewish wedding ceremony. Listen to what Jesus, this is really the first time he introduces to his disciples. John 14, listen to what Jesus said in John 14, and think about it in the context of those guys understanding a Jewish wedding. Your heart must not be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. Listen to what Jesus said to them. I'm going to prepare a place for you. How many times have you heard that verse and didn't understand it was in the context of the pattern of a Jewish wedding ceremony where they would have completely understood the groom goes to his father's house to prepare a place. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, guys, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I'm going. You see, he's promising his bride that he's coming back for them. Listen to this passage in Matthew 26. We mentioned in the Jewish ceremony that it was sealed with a cup of wine. Listen to what Jesus told his disciples at the Last Supper. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed it and broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat it, this is my body. Then he took the cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood that establishes the covenant. Now watch this. It is shed for, the, for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now pay attention to verse 29. But I tell you from this moment, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until that day. What is that day? That day he's referring to is the wedding banquet. Until that day when I drink it in a new way in my Father's kingdom with you. So here's what Jesus said at the Lord's Supper. Guys, I'm not going to drink this again. And I will not drink this until we're together at the wedding banquet. And at that point, we'll be drinking it in a new way. Because you will be with your groom. So that's the path to the banquet. What about the preparation of the bride? Let's look at that in Revelation 19, 6 through 8. Now, we've known that, man, there is a million, billion dollar industry right now of preparing women to be brides. The amount of money that's spent is unbelievable. Adrian Rogers said this. I was listening to him talk about this. And Adrian Rogers said this, if you don't know who Adrian Rogers is and you're young, you need to go Google Adrian Rogers or get on YouTube and listen to Adrian Rogers. An amazing, we call him the Prince of Preachers back in the day. Just just such a great, great pastor at Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis for a long, long time. Adrian Rogers said this, he said, I've never seen a bride that wasn't beautiful. Now he said there were some that just kind of slid in. He said, "But, but, but they were all beautiful, right? And only Adrian Rogers can say that. I mean, he just had that much clout. Guys, the reality is, is that I I would say this. One of the greatest joys that I have of being a pastor is standing right here or at any other place or venue and watching the groom see his bride for the first time. It is an amazing, amazing picture. Now, we're doing this first look stuff. If you're thinking about getting married, don't do a first look. Let it be in front of everybody because all you're doing is just avoiding you falling apart, guys. Because I'm telling you, I've never seen a guy not fall apart in that moment. It's an amazing, amazing moment. I want you to think about this. What is the preparation of the bride happening? You ladies that have been brides understand the preparation you went through for that event. Well, there are three things that have to happen in the bride's life spiritually for us to be prepared. Number one is redemption. Well, let me read the passage first. Then I heard something like a voice of a vast multitude, Revelation 19, 6, like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumbling of loud thunder, saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty, has begun to reign. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has finally come, and his wife has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints." Let me give you three things that need to happen in the life of a bride to be prepared. Number one is redemption. 
Now, the first thing that anyone has to do to be a part of the bride of Christ is they have to experience true redemption. Now, what do I mean by true redemption? I believe we've created something in our churches today that's scary. I believe that we've created this concept and idea of transactional redemption. I believe that we have people in our churches today who've entered into a transactional relationship with Jesus. We will do certain things, and as long as you do certain things. Jesus, I will do certain things as long as you keep me out of hell. And guys, listen, transactional salvation, transactional redemption does not create disciples. It creates arrangements. And Jesus isn't interested in creating arrangements. He's interested in creating disciples who are part of the bride of Christ. And so, church, we've got to make sure that we've not created some arrangement with Jesus so that when we die, we don't go to a bad place called hell. We've got to make sure that we've entered into this relationship with Christ that we know is based on our love for him. Now, you may say, how in the world could someone that young understand that concept, Jeff? So here's a couple things we have to remember. Number one, salvation is of the Lord. It's not of ourselves. So the Holy Spirit comes into us and he reveals to us who he is. And when he does that, we respond to that. And so as we respond to that, as we give our heart to him in the context that we know how, here's what happens. As we are discipled, we grow into understanding what it means to be in a love relationship with Jesus. And the more and more you learn, the more and more you grow in love with Christ. That is a, that's true redemption. That is not transactional redemption. We've got to make sure that our redemption transforms us. Not just creates a transaction in our life. First thing that has to happen is redemption. Well, here's the second thing that has to happen, and that is the rapture. Now, you're probably saying, oh, here we go. Guys, listen, the Lord has really taught me a lot on this this week because I want you to, I want you to get this because here's what we've done in the church. And, and, and I'm just talking from my personal perspective because this is what I've seen. We've talked and talked and talked and argued and argued and argued over the rapture and the timing of the rapture and when it's going to happen. And here's what we've missed. We've missed the marriage banquet of the Lamb. How many of you guys have ever heard a sermon on the marriage banquet of the Lamb? But how many times have you heard us talk about the rapture? It's amazing that we've missed the event. The event is the wedding. See, here's the reality, guys. The rapture, now now check this out. This is what the Lord really put on my heart this week. The rapture is the vehicle that takes us to the wedding. Isn't it crazy that we've written books and we've argued and created splits and schisms over the vehicle? And we've missed the wedding. I mean, are we really going to argue if the bus leaves at 2 or the bus leaves at 7? I just want to be on the bus. You see what we've done? I mean, we found ourselves in this this week at a table being very passionate about these things because we are passionate about these things. And it's like the Lord just hit me, guys, and he said, you're missing the point. The point is the wedding. Don't argue about what time the limo leaves. Focus on the wedding. Next event that must happen to prepare us. Now, here's what's interesting. We've got to understand the rapture in this context. What is the purpose of the rapture? The purpose of the rapture is to prepare the bride. Now, guys, we need to understand this. Right now, we are not prepared for the wedding. Yes, we've been redeemed, but we are not prepared for the wedding. Here's why. Because the bodies that we're in right now cannot handle immortality. So listen to what the rapture does. Two things it does. It, 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 it takes us and it changes us. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. And so right now, guys, we yes, we are waiting for the bus. But here's what we've got to understand. The bus takes us to the event. And so let's not focus so much on the bus and start focusing on the wedding. That's what Christ wants us to look at. That's what he wants us to celebrate. Can you imagine us getting to heaven and Jesus looking at us and saying, I can't believe you spent so much time talking about how you were going to get here. It's the wedding banquet that we need to be focusing on. Jesus will come and he will grab us. And now, here's what's amazing. And this is a hard concept to think about. Those in heaven right now, are waiting for the same thing that we on earth are waiting for. 
Check that out. Those in heaven right now are living in their souls. Their souls are in heaven. But they've not received their glorified bodies yet. We are here on earth in our broken, fallen bodies. We've not received our glorified bodies yet. So guess what's going to happen at the rapture? At the rapture, we're all going to be changed. The Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. So those who have died and gone on before us, they get their glorified bodies first. And then we who are still alive, if it happens today, we get our glorified bodies after they do, and we go up in the air to be with the Lord forever and ever. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 50. He said, brothers, I tell you this, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, for cor and corruption cannot inherit in corruption. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed in the moment, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. For this corruptible must be clothed in incorruptibility, and this mortal, speaking of our bodies, must be clothed with immortality. Guys, we can't go to the wedding right now because we don't have bodies that can handle it. Because we still have corruptible, mortal bodies. But there will be a day. There will be a day when that trumpet blasts and the father comes to get us. Our groom comes to get us. When our groom comes to get us, here's what he brings with him. He brings with him the power for us to change. And it's at that point we'll receive the bodies that will be prepared for the wedding. Here's the third thing that talks about in preparation is rewards. Don't miss this. It's very interesting that at the end of the verse, it talks about, first it talks about the fine linen that we've been given to wear. Now, when we talk about this fine white linen, we know what that reference is. That reference is imputed righteousness. That means that we're standing there. We are a part of the bride of Christ because, not because of our righteousness or anything that we've done, but we're standing there. Why? Because of the righteousness of Jesus. That's what imputed righteousness means. That means we have been given our wedding gowns. We didn't have to go buy them. We didn't have to have them made. We didn't have to do any of those kinds of things. We are given our wedding gowns. And so our gowns are given to us by Jesus. It is called imputed righteousness. So we stand there before the Father in the righteousness of Christ. But watch this. Notice what it says at the end of verse 8. For the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Now why would it say that the, that the white linen we have, we know is, it was given to us. It says that in Revelation. But then it turns around and says, it represents the righteous acts of the saints. We need to dig into that. So let me say this before I give you an explanation. I think it's hard to be definitive here. So let me be clear with that. I think it's hard to be definitive, but I really like what one commentator said, and I think it makes sense to me. It was customary for the bride to bring a gift for the bridegroom at the wedding banquet. So it was customary that the bride would come with a gift for the bridegroom. Now, have you ever heard, we've talked a lot about this, that our acts, our works while on this, while on this earth in this body are going to be judged. That's the judgment we go through. It's called, the, it's called the judgment seat of Christ. So all the things that we've done in the body since we've been a believer in Christ, all those acts will be judged. And so those, those that are for Christ will come out shining like gold, silver, and precious stones. Those that were done in the flesh and for us will be burned up like wood, hay, and stubble. So we'll basically go through the fire and everything we've done since we've been a believer in Christ will be burnt. Now we say this, so then we are given rewards. We're, and the Bible says that very clearly. We are rewarded for those things. Then we say those rewards are laid at the feet of Jesus. Here's a question I want to ask you. When does that happen? You get me? When does that happen? You see, here's what I think this means. I think this means that our white linen wedding robes are going to be decorated with our righteous acts. Those that we have been rewarded for after going through the judgment seat of Christ. And you know what we do when we get there? We show up and we give our gift to the groom. Now let me ask you a question. And I hope this makes you think this. What's your wedding gown going to look like when you stand before Jesus? Again, you can't, I think it's hard to be definitive here. But I think for me, it all makes sense. Because I believe that there are going to be those things that says for the white linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. There's something about that white linen that represents righteous acts that we have done. 
and we will stand before God. And I love that image. Like I love the picture of us standing there with our gift to the groom. Because think about it, guys. Groom, you gave me this many years of my life. You gave me this many resources. You gave me this much time, talent, and abilities. So, Father, here's my reward to you. Groom, here's my reward to you. Here's my gift to you. This is what I did with what you gave me. And I think there are other teachings of Jesus that support that. Well, let's get to the purpose of the banquet in verses 9 and 10. Then he said to me, write, those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb are fortunate. He also said to me, these words of God are true. Now watch this. Then I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow slave with you and your brothers who have the testimony about Jesus. Worship God because the testimony about Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Again, this was a greater reminder for me. A great reminder for me as I began wrestling with this concept. It was a great reminder for me because of how sensitive we tend to get when it comes to some of these issues. Here's the point. If we talk about prophecy and we don't end up with Jesus, we've completely missed the point. Listen to what the writer says. Listen to what John says as he writes this. He said, don't, because here's what happened. John saw all that he saw. I mean, think about this, guys. John saw the wedding. Can you imagine John sitting there seeing the bride of Christ in front of the groom and their white linen robes decorated with the the righteous acts of the saints? John saw this. He got so excited, he fell down on his face, and he worshiped the messenger. And that messenger quickly said, don't you do that. You get up. You don't worship me. Worship God. And watch what he says. Because the testimony about Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony about Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Guys, throughout this this series, as we talk about some amazing things, if we don't worship the lamb, we've missed it. The wedding is about the lamb. The new heaven and the new earth is about the lamb. The second coming of Christ is about the lamb. It's all about the Lamb, and it's all about Jesus. We can get so hung up, and here's what, here's what I took from this, it, it, at, least in, at least in my world. We can tend to worship our views more than we worship Jesus. You see, I'm this, or I'm this, or I'm this, or I'm this. And what about just saying that I'm a part of the bride of Christ? I'm just a part of the bride of Christ. And I don't really know when the bus is coming, but I'm telling you the bus is coming. And it's picking up the bride, and I'm going to be on the bus. That's all that matters. And when the bus gets there, I'm going to the wedding banquet of the Lamb. Because it's all about the Lamb. Listen, church, let's let's not get so lost in our theological pictures of how we think things are going to happen. Man, God really convicted me on this this week because I've been so, I've been so rigid about a pre-tribulation view of the rapture. And never once have I been rigid about the wedding banquet of the Lamb. And then I thought, guys, this. When Jesus said, no man knows the time or the day of when he's coming, who am I to be so arrogant to say I know? Right? Because only Jesus knows. Here's what I need to be preaching to you. Be ready. Be ready. Make sure that you're redeemed, that you're truly redeemed. Make sure that you know Jesus Christ in a true redemptive way. Make sure that when the bus comes, you're getting on the bus. Because it's coming. And when we get on that bus, we get changed. And we get changed into our immortal bodies to go and be with Jesus forever. Because it is about Jesus. Let's never lose that. Church, listen, I want us to start speaking the correct language. Yes, is there a rapture coming? There there absolutely is a rapture coming. But let's not celebrate the vehicle and miss the event. Can you imagine if someone asked you about your wedding, all you could talk about was the car you rode into your wedding? Man, let me tell you about the car I rode. It was amazing. Oh, I'd get this, it's this. What about your wedding ceremony? Oh, that was okay. But man, let me tell you about the car I rode in. I think that's, that's, that's at least what I've been doing. 
I was more concerned about the vehicle than I was the event. Let's not miss the event. And the event we're waiting for, guys, is for our wedding to be complete. And when our wedding with the Lamb is complete, we will spend all of eternity with Him. You see, next week, we're going to see the Lamb turn into the conqueror. And He comes back on a white horse. And He establishes His kingdom. Why does He do that? He does that so that He could he could, he could spend eternity with his bride. That's us. So man, yes. Is there a part of it for us in there? Absolutely. And we don't need to avoid that. We don't need to avoid celebrating what the lamb has provided for us. But let's not forget that the spirit of prophecy is what? It's Jesus. Father, thank you that you're coming. And Lord, when you come, you're going to take us and you're going to change us. And you're going to prepare us for this great wedding banquet. Father, as we, as we anticipate that, your instruction to us was to be ready. So Lord, we know that it could be any day. We believe that. Your word is so clear. Just the parable of the 10 virgins, Father, so clear. Five were ready and five were not. Lord, let us be found in that group that was ready and waiting for the groom to come. And Father, I thank you that there will be a time in our lives where we'll be raptured and we'll be changed. And those in heaven will be reunited with their glorified bodies and those here on earth will be caught up and receive their glorified bodies. And Father, we will be prepared then to spend all of eternity with you. Physical, in physical bodies, Lord, that we will, we will serve with you, reign with you, and spend all of eternity with you. We will share your inheritance as your bride. So Father, until that day, let us be ready.